afternoon. Uh, the title of the message is Receiving and Giving. Receiving and Giving. It's a good time of year to talk about that. we got Thanksgiving where we think about, you know, giving thanks to God for all He's given to us. And, and uh, obviously Christmas comes. We think about the gift that was given to us. We give one another gifts. And so it's a great time of the year to think about giving and receiving. And, and, uh, but notice why I just said giving and receiving. That's usually the way that we hear it. And the message, I particularly wanted to say receiving and giving. And I hope by the time I'm done, you'll understand why I say it that way. But the phrase giving and receiving that way is even in the Bible. Philippians 4, 15 says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving but ye only, and it's a little bit debatable. Some have uh, differing opinions as to what exactly is being said there. But that phrase, giving and receiving, we use that a lot of times. And typically, I know in my life, maybe my temptation, and I'm guessing most people feel this way, uh, our motive for giving can sometimes become a little selfish, right? We're giving in hopes of receiving back. That's often what we do. And so you think about this, a lot of verses in the Bible, I'm going to look at a few of them. Uh, Malachi, on the way up here, we're going through, uh, uh, I have my, my daughter help me mark these uh, little different, different spaces, and I tell her what verse and everything that, to go to, and she marks it for me. And I said, Malachi, and of course everybody just assumed, oh, that's, you must be preaching on tithing, because that is the, <laughs> the main thing that's taught out of the book of uh, Malachi, and that's not really what I'm teaching on uh, preaching on to, at all tonight this afternoon but Malachi 3 is a great verse though Malachi 3 verse 10 bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith saith the Lord of hosts if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that ye shall not there shall not be room enough to receive it isn't that a blessing? I mean, that sounds like a great deal. You give unto the Lord, and He's going to show you how much more He can give. And uh, he, I can't, obviously, you've heard that expression, you can't outgive the Lord. Look at uh, the book of Luke, Gospel according to Luke, in chapter 6, Luke 6. Luke 6, and go to verse 38. He says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. This is the part we like. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, withal it shall be measured to you again. Now, if I was a TV preacher, and I was standing up, and I wanted to get more money out of you, I'd say, look, if you just give... You won't be able to hold back the blessings of God on your life. <laughs> if you give $9.95 right, to this ministry, God's going to give you an abundance of... And uh, some people, that's the way they think about their giving. And isn't that a selfish motivation, right? Now, to some extent, you're like, well, at least they're giving. <laughs> right? But yeah, right. If, I, if somebody has the attitude like, all right, I'm going to give God, but the only reason I'm going to give to God is so that he'll you know, repay me back you know, in abundance. And, uh, and so they give to the Lord expecting that. And let's say it never comes. Like what they're hoping to see never, never comes. You know what a lot of people will do? Well, that's just a crock. You know, it just, <laughs> that was, somebody lied to me. God doesn't work that way. Because he's not a genie. He's not a, you know, a, a, a good luck charm or superstitious type of a thing where you just, well, if I give X amount, he'll give me and I'll increase my, my returns, you know, on my, on my investment. And so here's a lot of times the idea that we come up with is, what can I get out of it? And you want to give to the Lord and you say, well, he says in the Bible that you can't outgive the Lord. And if you give to him, he's going to give back to you. And that's very true. That is a principle in there. I can, I can uh, attest to that myself. Uh, not everybody is going to, the Lord's not going to work necessarily in everyone's heart the same way. But I've heard tons of testimonies from people uh, that can agree, would, would agree with me on this. When the Lord in my life was teaching me about the principle of tithing and giving to the Lord, I remember feeling like... Um, 
you know, it was something I had to do as, as a matter of like discipline. You know, I got to be disciplined in this. Just every day, every week, I got to make sure that I give uh, a 10% right off the top. You know, I get my paycheck. It's not like do all the bills and then let's see if there's anything left I can give to the church. But it was just like 10% off of what, what I, I, I got. And there were times in my life where I'm doing this. And you, you might think like, oh, God wouldn't do this to you. But I, in my life, this is how I feel God did. If I would skip that, you know, I would say like, well, I just it's, things are really tight this week. man. I'm just not going to put that in there. I'm telling you, man, that same amount would come out. I'd get a speeding ticket, and the same amount that I was supposed to tie, I'd be like, oh, there's a speeding ticket. I'm not saying that to, like, I mean, God's going to work differently in everyone's heart. I'm not trying to say that to scare anybody into giving. I'm just saying in my own life, there is a, some truth to that principle, right? Uh, and, and it did help me in my life to realize that, hey, don't be afraid to give to God because God, you know, he can provide for you whatever, whatever he needs whenever you need it. So really, that's kind of the principle I want to talk about this afternoon, not so much about tithing or, or what the Bible says about that. We could preach a whole message about that sometime. But basically, this is it. When you, by faith, that's the key word, that's what we're going to talk about. When you, by faith, give unto the Lord of that which you have received. And by the way, it's not just talking about money. I'm not talking about just money right now, but of all that which God gives us, when we, by faith, will give unto the Lord that which you have received, he continues to replenish it, and get this part, so that you can give more. So every time you're giving, right, for his work, or you're giving unto others to help others, by faith, knowing, hey, God's going to take care of me, and you do that, he is going to replenish that. Why? So that you come out ahead in the end? Like, oh, well, I mean, uh, I think I got the better end of the deal here. <laughs> you, know, I gave, you ever do that at Christmas? Like, I remember there's been times uh, at Christmas that we, you know, gave out our gifts. You finally figured it all out. Like, I got this thing for that person and that. You got all your gifts done at the end of the, end of the day. I mean, you opened up your presents, and you're looking at your hoard, and you're like, man, I think, I think we did better than, <laughs> you know, we got, the, we got the better deal this year, right? Well, that, don't let your giving be like that. That's ridiculous. Because all that, it's not giving at all. All that is just hopes of getting, you know, getting something. And so uh, there is a difference between hoping that uh, if you give to somebody that they're going to give to you the same or more, and that in just giving, all right? So here's what the Bible teaches. Uh, first of all, let's talk about this, receiving from the Lord. This time of year, we, again, we think about all that the Lord has done for us, and, uh, and we think about what we have to be thankful for. I talked about this morning, um, you know, last week in Iola, I taught a mess, I preached a message that said, uh, uh, Thanksgiving comes before Christmas, and I won't tell you all, all about that, but today's message was this. This was a tough one for me, all right? This morning's message was fasting comes before feasting, all right? So Thursday, we got, you know, the day that we've kind of become gluttons, and, uh, and, but the principle is that in our lives, before we can celebrate, because, look, I think feasting is a big thing in the Bible. It's important that we take, take what God has given us and we enjoy that. Uh, he tells us to enjoy that, and we can, we, we can do that. Uh, and so feasting is a good thing. It's a good time. Wednesday's message is called Eat the Fat and Drink the Sweet. I mean, that's the, my, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. <laughs> that's in there. You didn't know that's in there? So feasting is a good thing, but before we can get to the feasting and the celebrating and all oh, what great things I have, there has to be time of fasting and understanding that, you know, all the luxuries that I have, all the provisions that God has made for me, um, right, the reason I'm thankful for that is because I could be in a situation where I don't have any of that. And so it, it gets us into a point where we are very, very thankful for that. And I, I was saying this morning about this, do you know that we eat better than kings ate in the Bible days? I mean, kings, they would, they would eat. I'm talking about like you'd have somebody come and they'd be, you know, feeding the king the grapes and all this kind of stuff. But, but look, they didn't have all the luxuries we have today. You know, they couldn't just open up their cabinet of spices and go to whatever spice they want. You know, they'd have to send people all over the world to get those things. And, and uh, they didn't have a refrigerator where they could just keep the milk and the eggs and all that kind of stuff. They, they you know, 
granted, they had a lot of stuff. They were kings. They had, you know, unlimited wealth. We have it all at our fingertips today. And it becomes real easy for us to get spoiled and forget to give thanks because we just have it all. It's so easy. You need lights, you just flip the switch. You need heat, you just turn the thermostat up. You need air conditioning, you just turn the thermostat down. I mean, wow, we live in such, a, and we become spoiled. And America has really, uh, the reason that it's so hard to find thankful people, right, is because we have it all. Even the poor people on welfare have more than, you know, than so many uh, around the world. <coughs> so God has no doubt blessed us with physical blessings. Okay, let's talk about physical blessings first. Our health. Amen? Aren't you glad you have your health? I'm looking around. I, I can't think of anybody in here. Don't you ever get mad when you see a sign for somebody that's begging for food and you're looking at them and they're walking around and you're like, your feet are working, your hands are working, you know? You know how to spell. You wrote that sign. You know, what are you doing there? <laughs> Go get to work, you know? Uh, but when somebody really has the disabilities, they really do have the poor health, they can't get out of bed, they can't go, now you understand. I feel bad for that person. That's the poor people that we're supposed to help. That's the poor people that, uh, that really are suffering in this world. In our lives, we don't have that. Look around. We're all healthy. We're all, we all have good health. So Psalm 42, 11 says this, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. I love that song, uh, Praise Ye the Lord the Almighty. And it says, Praise Ye the Lord the Almighty, King of creation. O my soul, praise him, for he is thy health and salvation. Right? Uh, God gives me, I remember the, whenever that song, I'm sure I've shared this before, but when I, uh, before I really memorized that song or anything, I was on the trail, and I had just broken my leg, right? Got two plates and 16 screws in my leg. By the way, this morning I woke up, and I was thinking, it's going to rain today. I can just tell, but it never did, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, but um, so I remember when I, when I broke that, uh, thinking I was never probably going to do any long-distance running or hiking or anything like that again. And then a few months went by, and I was putting some weight on it. felt pretty good. And so I got a walking stick, and I started hitting the trail. And I'd go back uh, as far as I could go. I got to where I could even do, like, six-mile hikes. I'd be limping pretty good on the walking stick. But it was just a great time, just quiet time with the Lord. I remember going out there, and, uh, and I didn't know that song very well, but it was in my mind. And, and so I was like, man, how's that song go? And I'm like, Praise ye the Lord. And I'm singing on the trail. And I just had one of those moments that, you know, you, you don't necessarily want anyone to see you because I don't know if I, how excited I got. Maybe lift my hands or something. I don't know. But I <laughs> don't want to look weird. But I was a great moment because I was thinking about this song. And I was just really singing that. And I'm thinking, he's, I got to get back and look at a song because I can't really remember how those words go. But he is my health and my salvation. And I'm thinking, praise the Lord for my health. Praise the Lord, yeah, I have uh, plates and screws in my leg, but you know what? I'm walking six miles on a trail. I'm enjoying this time. A lot of people who don't even have legs, they can't even go anywhere. And I'm thinking, man, praise the Lord for my health and the strength and, and all that I have. Praise the Lord for this, our wealth. You know, some people I've heard say this, your health is your wealth. Have you ever heard that phrase? Like even if you had lost all the money, you didn't have any money. Like I said, that guy on the street, holding the sign, writing that, like he's got some health. He could go out and make some money. He can do something. Uh, so praise God if you have, uh, you know, your health and everything's working the way that it's supposed to. Uh, but, but truly God supplies our, phys our financial wealth. He provides all, for all of our needs, you know. On, obviously the Bible talks about this, makes it clear that we're not supposed to strive to be rich, right? Is that pretty clear in the Bible? We're not supposed to strive to be rich. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. If you love money, go after the things of the world. You're covetous. Uh, that's a bad deal. Somebody who's covetous, uh, you look at um, 1 Corinthians 5, where he's talking about people that need to be kicked out of the church. And he's like drunkards and extortioners and adulterers. He's talking about all this. And, he's, and, and one of the things in there is covetous, right? I'm not going to take the time to look there, but I'm sure that's what it says. One of those covetous, somebody who's just going after the things, the material things of this world, that's more important to them than anything else. He's saying, look, you don't even need that in the church. 
right? Because that's going to mess up your, your thinking and that's going to mess up your desires. Who are we supposed to be trusting in? We're supposed to be trusting in the Lord. Now, praise the Lord that he allows some people to have good jobs where they have resources and they have uh, the money. And all of us should look at, especially if we have families to take care of, look at, well, what do we need? And go out and make that and provide for them. I'm not, no, by any means is anybody supposed to say, well, I'm not supposed to be rich. And so just go be, you know, lazy bum or something like that. We're supposed to, that God made us to be able to do that. And so, but praise the Lord, he's given us an abundance of wealth. I've never felt poor in my entire life. I don't think my kids have ever felt poor. Uh, and I know there's time where we've been wondering, like, where they're, you know, times in our life, not, not any time recently, but <laughs> what are they going to, what are we going to feed them this week, you know? And, uh, and, but the Lord always provided. They didn't ever feel like they were doing without. And all of us have so much to be thankful for, for all that God's provided for us. And really, what did he promise? What did God promise? If you follow him, seek the kingdom, right, and you follow the Lord, has he promised you all the abundance and all the wealth and all the luxuries of this world? He didn't. He just said, look, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide your food, and I'll provide your raiment, and you're not going to have to worry. Just follow me, and I'll take care of you. And he, sa and he says that, and he's done that. He's proven himself so much. I know in my own life he has for sure. All right, so our relationships a physical blessing that God has blessed us with uh, that we ought to be thankful for. Uh, relationships, our, our, our parents that he gave us, our spouses, friends, church family, we ought to be thankful for that. No doubt about it. But then also, he has blessed us, us with spiritual blessings. And believe it or not, spiritual blessings far outweigh those physical blessings. Let's look at some of that. We're going to go to e Ephesians for a second and break this down. Ephesians chapter 1, 1 through 14. This would easily be a message in itself, but I'm just going to briefly explain this. I don't want to get too caught off on this uh, rabbit trail here, but uh, this is a passage of Scripture that could easily be confusing. Some people have confused it f for sure. <clears throat> Let me read... I'll just start at the very beginning so we can get a running start into it. I'll read all the way to 14, and I want to break it down here, okay? Here's what he's saying in Ephesians. Number one, he's saying this. We are blessed with being accepted into the beloved, okay? And here's what I put in my notes. We're accepted into being part of the predestined beloved, don't get bent out of shape. Don't get scared. That's what the Bible says, and I'll explain it here as we get there. Look at it here. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, let me just pause for a second. So what has he predestined us to? Well, here's, here's the deal. So... Before the foundations of the earth, God had this plan. Jesus Christ was the slain before the foundations of the earth, right? He had this plan. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that his son would be slain. He, he knew that whole deal. And he knew this, that there would be a group of people, right? All those, all those, anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There'd be a group of people that would accept him and they would follow him. They would, uh, you know, they'd, they'd call on him to be their savior, all that. He understood that that was going to happen. And he said, that group of people, whoever it is, right, it's going to be dependent on our own free will uh, to become that, that group. And he said, that people will be my people. And then he's saying that I'm going to bless them. Uh, what is it? Romans 8 talks about that. And he's like, I'm going to... Um, uh, those who I predestined, uh, let's see, those who I uh, foreknew, 
you know, I predestined those who I predestined, I called, and those who I called. You understand, there's this process that he's got you through. Once you are one of those uh, people, once you're a part of the body, you know, and then he's, he's going to provide for you what you need to get in life. So you're predestined to be part of that group in Christ Jesus. I've lost some people, I'm sure. The spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. The elect one, the predestined one, was Christ Jesus. Here's the blessing is that we are added and counted into that beloved. We're counted into that, that body, right? How did that happen? Because he predestined some to go to hell and some to go to heaven? That's not what he says. You're predestined because you decided to join that group of people that he was going to bless. I hope that makes, <laughs> makes sense. But anyway, so number one, here's the spiritual blessing that we're blessed uh, of being accepted into the beloved. Verse 4 through 7, we are blessed with being forgiven of our sins. Isn't that great? Uh, 4 through 7, according to He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we, uh, all those who are part of the Beloved, should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of the children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according uh, to the good pleasure of His will to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have, here we go, redemption through His blood and forgiveness of sins. Why would our sins have to be forgiven if God just made us to do that, that thing? Does that make sense? Uh, but they're forgiven because we've chosen to be part of the Beloved. We've chosen to receive Christ according to the riches of His grace. Not by works, it's by grace. Right? Something that we don't deserve, something that we didn't pay for. He gave it to us. It's grace wherein he hath, uh, he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Okay, so here's the third thing. Uh, we're blessed with being accepted into the beloved, blessed with having our sins forgiven. Then on top of that, he gives us the Holy Spirit that guides us, leads us in the truth, seals us into the day of redemption. Amen. And here's what he says. Uh, in fact, I'm getting ahead of myself. Here's what he says in verse 8. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And it's so interesting that he doesn't say anything in there about, because you turned away from your sins and you followed after God, you can have the spiritual blessings. It doesn't say that. I'm preaching tonight on, uh, on uh, what is, you know, a lot of people go to, uh, how does he say that? He says, once God winked at, this is in Acts 17, he says, once God winked at, he said, but now commandeth all men to repent, right? And, you, and people quote that and they say, see, you got to repent. Well, I'm all for repenting, but when it comes to salvation, read that verse. They're repenting of their ignorance that they had when they were following after other gods because they didn't know who Jesus was. It says nothing about their wicked works. Yes, they're sinners. We're all sinners. But the fact was that their sins were for, are forgiven whenever they say, oh, this is the one. You know, and they turn uh, from their ignorance and they believe in the truth. All throughout the Bible, you just can't escape it. And that's what we see right here. But anyway, I got off a little bit. But the, the blessings are that we are saved. We are act, added to the beloved. Beloved, sins forgiven. Aren't you so glad when we get to heaven? You know, it was years. I think I was probably either halfway through Bible college or maybe even through Bible college before I really understood the fact. And it's probably my own fault. I'm not blaming the college uh, that I really understood the fact that we are not going to be judged according to our sins as Christians. A lot of people don't get that. A lot of people think now he says he's going to come and he's going to give his rewards to those, you know, based on the good or the bad that you did. But when you study that all out through Scripture, what that means is you're going to lose rewards 
if you go the wrong way, you start doing the wrong things, you're going to lose rewards. But in the end, when we get to heaven, it's not like, well, let me see, you know, what kind of payments can I make you pay while you're in the millennium or something like that. He's just going to give out rewards based on what you did. All those things that you didn't do for Christ, you might have thought it was good works. You might have thought, you know, uh, you were helping society or you were doing some kind of great work, but really it wasn't doing anything for the Lord. All that stuff just burns up. It didn't mean anything. All the stuff you did that looked like a very good thing to do for the Lord, but really you were doing just to be seen of men, that's all going to burn up, right? That doesn't mean anything. But, all, but ultimately what he's going to reward us for is what we did for him. What, aren't you glad? I mean, I remember, I remember in times in my life where I thought they were going to have a recorder uh, showing in, in front of everybody, right? And we were all going to have to stand there, even as Christians, and be like, you remember that time you did that? And everybody's going to watch, and you're going to be like, oh, man, don't look. <laughs> I didn't want you to know I did that, right? Anybody ever thought that that was going to happen? Like, you know, all your works, you're going to have to have a count of everything that you, you've done. Mm -mm, I'm so glad Jesus paid for my sins, past, present, future. I get to heaven, and he's going to be like, what sins? I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> right? So anyway, what spiritual blessings we have. Aren't you glad you're saved? Aren't you glad you have the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit, and he talks about this, he leads you into wisdom, and he guides you, and he gives you, uh, you know how the Bible talks about the foolish things of this world. He, Jesus, God's chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. Uh, you have the Holy Spirit in you. You're saved. You're out there preaching the gospel. You know, we're knocking on doors preaching the gospel. Some people think that's a foolish thing to do. But it's weird. We, we have this understanding. I just preached uh, uh, part five of a series on Catholicism in Sunday school. And once you just start studying through these things, like when I was doing ca the charismatic movement, you start seeing it everywhere you look. Like, there, oh, that's an influence from that. That's an influence from that. And I'm looking at Catholicism, and I'm thinking, man, when you get confused on salvation, when you don't understand what it means to be a saint, you think you have to work for your sainthood, right? So that hopefully one day the Pope would declare you a saint. And uh, you've done all the things that you had to do, and enough people have prayed for you once you died. Where do they get that, right? But we can read the Bible clearly because we're saved, and we have the Holy Spirit within us, and we can say, well, that's ridiculous. Why do you believe that? You know, that's ridiculous. Why do you think baptism saves you? Twice on Thursday, we knocked on a door where somebody said, oh, yeah, you got to get baptized in order to go to heaven, right? It's water baptized. And, uh, and we're like, no, you, don't, you misunderstood it. That's a picture of being baptized in Christ, but they, they don't understand that. But aren't you glad that you have knowledge and wisdom that even professors that have gone in their entire life at a Bible college or something like that but aren't saved, you know, they don't even get that. So now here's the question. You have all this world of wealth, all this world of, uh, you know, you got everything in the refrigerator, you got money in the bank, you got all the things you need, you got your, uh, your provisions are made, you got all the spiritual blessings. You're saved. You know the gospel. Uh, you understand that you have uh, the Holy Spirit within you unto the day of rede redemption. You're not going to lose that. You have all of those things. The question is, what are you going to do? Why did God give you all those things? So you can just sit around and just waste it? No, he didn't give you that. He gave you physical resources so that you can use those. He gave you spiritual blessings, right? Other, why wouldn't he just give us, when we got saved, why wouldn't he be like, all right, great, come up to heaven, right? Why would he leave us here with spiritual blessings and knowledge of the gospel and all that? He wants you to give that and use that to reach others. He wants to use that for his work and for his, his kingdom, okay? Uh, the Bible says in Luke 12, 48, for unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much, of him, they will ask the more. All right? We have so much. In, in America, uh, as Americans, as living in this time of, of life that we do, as Christians, as, uh, as independent Baptists who are actually saved, not just calling ourselves Christians. I mean, we have so much, and so it's going to be expected that we use that. Now, real quickly, so, all right, I appreciate that. It's close to Thanksgiving time, giving and receiving, receiving, giving, whatever. What in the world does that have to do with Abraham? What does that have to do with Hebrews chapter 11? So let's go to Hebrews 11. This is right where we are in our text. 
<clears throat> We've been talking about Abraham, and then we're going to come back to Abraham, but it stops, it pauses and talks about the first lady in the Bible who's uh, uh, part of this, what I've been calling pilgrims and sojourners. Well, the Bible calls them that, but... And it mentions this fir the first lady, which is Sarah. And it says, uh, let's just start at verse... Uh, let's start at verse 17. No, oh, where am I? Let's start at verse 10. 11. Through faith also, Sarah received, uh, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. I'd say she was past age. Because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Okay, so let's real quickly go over to Genesis. Look at Genesis 17. We'll read the story. <clears throat> I won't read all the story. I'm assuming most people, probably everybody in here, has a decent idea of what went on here. But... We've got Abraham is about 100 years old, and, and Sarah's not too much, younger, too much uh, younger than that. And let me see here, Genesis 17, verse 15. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her, Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And Abram fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? Now, how many people have ever heard someone say, Well, Sarah, you know, God kind of got onto her and rebuked her because she laughed. And I've always thought, like, well, Abraham laughed too. And then I heard somebody say one time, yeah, but it must have been different. Like, Sarah must have laughed, like, not believing. And maybe Abraham's laugh was like he was so happy. Well, read the next verse. And Abraham said unto God, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. He's saying, what? I'm 100 years old. You want me to have another son and my daughter, I mean, I'm another child and for my wife to, uh, uh, to bear whenever she's 90? And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, and it, it keeps on going. Skip down to chapter 18 now. <clears throat> this is now when the, the angels come to talk to him. Of course, one is God himself. One's uh, basically, I think, I believe it's Jesus, pre-incarnate. And uh, chapter 18, verse 9. They're coming to Abraham to talk to him. They're fixing to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, And they said unto him, Where is Sarah, thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I, cert I, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. I guess this is the first time she heard that. Abraham didn't even tell her. I don't know. Where? Uh, let's see. Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now, now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am old, uh, waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee, according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. Don't ever try to lie to the Lord. I love that next verse. And she said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. That's the end of the story, the end of the argument right there. Okay, you're right. So we see this, that Abraham and Sarah, obviously their faith wasn't super strong because they laughed, they doubted. Abraham kind of argued a little bit. Well, how about Isaac? I mean, how about Ishmael? Can't we do Ishmael? And uh, so their faith wasn't super strong, which is a blessing to know, right? When, some, when God asks you to do something by faith, and you're like, well, my faith isn't strong enough. So what faith you have, man, trust, trust the Lord. And so he says, 
uh, by faith, they received the promise. Okay, so by faith, look, what did I say? We receive gifts. We receive what God gives us by faith, just trusting he's going to provide for us, and he does. And so that's what they did. They, they received a blessing from the Lord through faith. Abraham and Sarah, of course, indeed, they were miraculously given a son of their old age. And uh, Hebrews particularly talks about the faith of Sarah. It doesn't actually talk about the faith of, of Abraham there. But now let's look back at Hebrews 11 and skip down to verse 11. Hebrews 11, and let's look at 11. Uh, actually, 17, sorry, eleven seventeen. So now it's going to talk about Abraham again. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now that's real deep. Okay, that's deep theology and all, but here's the bottom line. Abraham was tried, right? And he was told to offer up his son, Isaac. Now, look, there are people that get, you know, crazy about this and they say, well, what kind of a God would tell Abraham to sacrifice his own son? Well, what kind of a God would give Abraham a, a son to begin with at 100 years old? Right? So quit trying to doubt God and just say, look, he by faith received a gift from God. God has every right to say, well, I want that gift back. Abraham's like, wait a minute. He promised me. I trusted by faith that this was going to be the one. He promised me. I've watched my son grow up. He's been healthy. He's been strong. And now God's telling me to sacrifice him back to him. But you know what's interesting is it doesn't really say, share anywhere that he really uh, lacked faith in this area. It's like his faith had built now over the years with God maybe. I don't know. And he just says this in Hebrews, we see that he says, accounting that God could raise him up, right? He says, well, I don't know what's going to happen. He wants me to sacrifice my son. I'm going to sacrifice him. That's going to be sad. I don't know how I'm going to tell my wife. <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh, by the way, God told me to sacrifice her. I got this feeling he didn't tell her. He's just like, hey, we're going to go do a sacrifice on the altar. Isaac lay. You know, he's got the wood and he's like, what? I got the wood here. Where's the, where's the offering? And, of course, we know he, the fact that he says that he received him as a picture, that's because if you remember the rest of the story, Abraham said, well, God will provide himself a lamb, right? And so uh, he gets ready to sacrifice him, and the angel stops him. And it's just a great picture for us. As we still tell the story today. It's still, a, it's still the gospel being preached in the Bible, and we can use that to even win somebody to the Lord. <clears throat> but Abraham had to just by faith say, you know what? By faith, I received the gift. Now by faith, I'm going to have to give the, the gift back. And he recognized how God works. And he said, and by faith, he'll raise him back up, right? By faith, he'll raise him back up. He already promised that he's going to fulfill his purposes. He already promised that I'm going to get to from point A to point B. I trust him. Along the way, I'm just going to have to obey him and do with my resources what he tells me to do and that's exactly how we're supposed to do as Christians he gives us children and we're supposed to say God you know what if you want my children you can take my children you want them to go to the uttermost parts of the world as missionaries so be it you want them to go you know off move away to the other side of the world I won't ever see them again it's all in your hands God because you're the one that gave them to us right you're welcome to have them back our money you know, maybe you had hard times and you finally got to a point in your life where you got money and you say, man, I just can't give, right? If I give, then I'm not going to have, you know, or maybe you do give to the Lord and you give and you say, look, he gave it to me. I gave some back. He blessed me again. And look, I came out ahead. I'm even doing better now than I was before I gave the first time. Well, guess what? You don't stop there. <laughs> you just keep emptying it out and he keeps on replenishing. Right. Why? Because it's not about storing things up or trying to get rich or trying to have the family just the way you want it or trying to have all the resources in this life according to your every heart's desire. It's about the Lord and doing his work. And he's going to give you what you need to accomplish what he wants you to accomplish. We're just stewards of his resources. It's a continual cycle 
of receiving and giving. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for all that you've given. You've given so much, and we're so undeserving uh, of what you've given us. Uh, but, Lord, I pray that you'll help us with all the resources that you've given us uh, just to freely give back, whether it be just giving, uh, giving to you uh, in, in whatever way, through just tithes and offerings or uh, giving up you with our service, giving you with everything that we have, Lord, uh, willingly and not grudgingly. And Lord, I pray that you will take what we have, even though it might, be, it might seem meager in the world's eyes. It might not seem like much, but I pray that you'll judge us according to our hearts, judge us according to our efforts, and uh, you will multiply that to get accomplished way more than we could ever imagine being accomplished for your name's sake. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.